Welcome back to another episode of Fresh Out of College, your weekly dose of sports and pop culture. My name is Drew Campbell, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Rihanna Shino. Today's guest is Kaylee Collins. She is the goalkeeper at USC right now, and she got drafted by the Orlando Pride recently from the NWSL. We had a great conversation with her, got to know her off the field with some fun quick hitters. Uh, We learned about her soccer career up to USC, and then also talked about for a really f- interesting master's um, capstone project that she's she's doing at U- USC. Yeah, we had a really good conversation with her, and let's get into it. Today, we are joined by Kaylee Collins, who is a redshirt senior at USC and was recently drafted by the Orlando Pride as the second goalkeeper to go in the NWSL draft, as well as being drafted. She's completing her master's of science and applied psychology, which we're going to talk about later and should be a really fun topic. Nonetheless, thank you, Kaylee, for joining us. Thanks, guys. I'm really excited to be here and talk with you guys. Um, Kaylee, before we get into the, my quick hitters and, uh, what we got for you talk about kind of, you know, this is an, this is a new start to the season. Um, obviously you're starting later than you usually do. Um, what is that like in the process with your team? Um, and kind of like the forming stage and the clustering of how you're getting ready for this season during the COVID time. Yeah, we usually get a decent amount of time. We usually come in, um, during the summer, and have all of our freshmen. I've taken summer classes like my whole time in college, um, just to like kind of be here. Summer is really our like preseason. Okay. Um, so that's really, it's usually super useful to like not only get the team around each other and like the girls around each other, but also to know um, like a lot of it, the nature of college is super weird because you're getting new people every year. So really like, how you play changes every year based on personnel, at least for us. Um, We focus a lot on like playing with who we have and with what we have. So the past, I don't know, like the past month has been kind of adjusting and um, just trying to like get everyone up to speed on like who we're going to be for this season. Um, So yeah, then the whole, I mean, obviously COVID's weird like brings on some new stuff, but um, I'm really proud of the team actually, like in the past month, um, just like getting everyone up to speed. We've learned so like, I just think about being a freshman right now and like everything that's being thrown at them yeah. is crazy. Um, <clears throat> so it's been a process, but I'm excited. We have our first game this, or it's going to be on, Thursday of this this coming Thursday so um, I'm excited to see we're actually gonna be playing two we're playing Pepperdine and the first game is like what counts and then we're gonna play a second game oh. in that same day kind of wow. as just to like I think both the teams came to that agreement just because everyone needs games right now you got to get that running in that was that's gonna be a lot I mean yeah oh my yeah gosh. I know a coach was like <laughs> Our coach was like, everyone be prepared. You will all play and you will all play minutes. So that's good. Yeah. I guess I, we don't really talk about it, but like, you're, you're right. I mean, you guys get a whole recruiting class in college and that, that whole time, you know, you got to take three weeks out of it just to, to get together and do that clustering stage of and forming and like find who, who's the leader and stuff like that. And it's quite different in the pros where it's like, you know, you have a set set five or in, in basketball, at least, um, But yeah, that's a big obstacle. And I mean, you guys are tackling it as much as you can. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, come come game time, you guys are ready to prepare, uh, ready to get going. But congrats to you on that. Um, And let's get into quick hitters. Um, For the listeners, this is basically just I'm going to be giving Kaylee 10 questions. Uh, Rita and I might go back and forth, but basically just an icebreaker and to get to know Kaylee kind of off the field. So, Kaylee, are you ready for this? I think so. I'm a little okay. nervous. Okay. If you were to have one superpower, what would it be? Flying. Flying? Why? Because I've always, that's always been my answer. I love the idea of flying. I used to long jump in high school, oh, wow. and that was long jumping and goalkeeping were like the two things that I felt like I could, like, like the explosiveness of flying. But I mean, but doing that for extended periods of time would be cool. 
Yeah. Talk about getting like the whole corner of the goal keep there, right? Like you're able to fly there and there. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. Exactly. <laughs> um, if you're stranded on an island for 90 days, what three items would you take if you knew that water and food um, were given to you? I went straight to food. I, I thought like. <laughs> no, it's too easy. It's a, it's a too easy one. Okay. All right. Three um, things. Three things. Rope. Um. I'm thinking of Survivor right now. I'm like, what do they have in Survivor? <laughs> like a tarp, rope, and um, a match. There we go. Nice. Yes. I Crack think I would, do, I would do a knife. Oh, I, I obviously have to think about this if I'm, if I'm asking. If you're going to ask. Um, I would do a knife, a tarp, because if it rains. And then um, what was my third thing? Oh, um, like a canteen, something to carry the water in. I don't know. Oh, that's smart. Really, that and the would... knife. That was really smart. <laughs> I have to. I have to cut rope or something. Come on. Yeah. I'm a, I'm but you a don't have rope. You don't have rope. Yeah, you can say true. rope. Well, you know, I I, <laughs> I have I... the rope. If we're there together, we're fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes <laughs> sense. Um, okay. Um, okay. So now we're gonna go to sort of more of the other things. Like, what are your all-time favorite movies, Kaylee? Okay, I would usually say um, 10 Things I Hate About You is, has always been, that was like my favorite high school movie. Um, I've gotten, oh, shoot. I liked that whole, okay, along with 10 Things I Hate About You, I really mm -hmm. like all the like, like the Rat Pack 80s movies, like um, 16 Candles uh, and Breakfast Pretty Club. in Pink. Breakfast Club. I love those. Those are like, those remind me of, my dad was super into like totally getting me like pop cultured on 80, 80s. So like that and the music, that just reminds me a lot of being That's good. Yeah. Ryota, we actually, in 10 Things I Hate About You, yep, um, about our campus was oh, right yeah. next to the high school in Tacoma. So yeah, yeah. We, we went to school like five minutes away from Stadium High School where that was, um, that was filmed. So, oh my gosh, I'm picturing the, um, the scene where he he's Heath Ledger coming song. down. Yep. Yep. Oh my god. Iconic. So talk about a talk about a recreating a prom uh, invitation there. That, yeah. That's for sure. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Pixar or Disney, which um, which animated uh, would you go for? Pixar or Disney movies? I would say Pixar. Yeah. yeah. Pixar. I mean, they both tug at the heart. But I know. it's just something about, you know, Pixar and like the action as well. But yeah, I mean, I think the set. OK, this is this is a tangent, which I'm really good at. But <laughs> the Disney movie, I think the saddest Disney movie has to still be The Lion King. Um, and I'm going to throw that out there because it just every time I have to every time I watch it, it's just like, ah, but I mean, they, so they've true. they've upped their game. And I mean, phew, tough. OK, That's, wait, was um was Inside Out Disney or Pixar? I feel like Inside Inside Out was, let me see, I have it all down. It's in Pixar. Inside Out is Pixar. Pixar's come awesome. out with some good ones as of late. I That's feel like true. they've been doing well. Yeah. I guess but I like would give them classic Disney out. movies are also hard to beat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I should have, maybe next time I'll do a time frame. The last okay, 10 yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're, we're flying through these. Um, now, recently there has been, I think, an uproar or an uprise of, um, like reality TV shows um, mm -hmm. talking about dancing or, or singing. So Kaylee, would you rather be on the Mac, the mask singer, lip sync battle, the voice or dancing with the stars? Oh my gosh. I would be on, um, what's the one that you finished the lyrics? Is that? Rita, do you know that? Oh one? no, I know what you're talking about. Um, I don't know what it's called, but that sounds like a- Okay, I'll do, I'll do- that one's good. I think I've seen com uh, commercials on that one. I don't think it's still around though. I think I they. Like I think it didn't last. But I would do that. Finish the lyrics or something like that. I would do that one. Yeah, I. I think I would do that one just because I don't don't think I could do any other one. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the mass singer thing scares me. I feel like that the whole con. I haven't actually watched it, but like my sister, my little sister, and my dad always watch it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's for, it's acquired taste. I would think it's just like I you think know, so too. 
how how do they know how can they just pick that out um <laughs> you know okay so now we've talked about your favorite movies what's your most overrated tv show that you think is on right now or has been on in the past oh like i something that i think is overrated yeah something that like I mean, yeah, something that you think got a lot of hype, but you were like, I just can't see it. I don't connect with it. Okay. Um, I didn't love, and I didn't like get into it. Um, I didn't like Shit's Creek. Like I only watched the first couple episodes and I, every time I say this, everyone's like, oh my God, no, like, you have to keep watching it. But I didn't love the first couple episodes, so I stopped watching it. Oh, I man, feel we ashamed. Tell your friends. We won't tell your friends. Yeah. You have to keep watching it, though. Okay, it yeah. gets better. It gets better. Rieta, what's your most overrated TV show right now? Man, overrated TV show? That's yeah. a hard question. It is a pretty hard... I feel like I just... I feel like when I get into TV show, I really get into it. But I kind of got... I'm just trying to think of shows where I just stopped watching it after a couple, like maybe the bachelor bachelorette. Like I watched, oh. I watched um, Claire and Tasha's, but like after a while, I just kind of was like, uh, the first couple I'm, were good, but I'm feeling that right now too, actually. I usually point. like, I was not a bachelor bachelorette person, but um, my roommate and I have started watching, started watching it and we got really into we decided to get really into it. Like it was a very intentional thing. We were like, mm-hmm. okay, we're going to do it. We're going to be bachelor right. people with um, what Claire and Tasha. Mm-hmm. And we got really into it. And now we're like doing it again for this one, Matt, I think mm-hmm. his name is. Mm-hmm. And um, they're losing me very quickly. <laughs> really? Like, this is really, yeah, I, I'm into it, but I also, all the drama is really stressing me out. Then, that's true it yeah. is it's definitely a drama packed and kind of like draining after the hour it is but draining it really is um the only reason why um danny and i are still watching it is because well for me is because um there's a contestant on the bachelor that's from everett i think or or someplace in washington and it's like a town away from danny so we're we're cheering her on and oh. it, it's fun but i mean it's definitely draining and these girls like really go after each other it's cutthroat I would I not so last. I get so angry. I get so angry last. at them. It's I can't definitely... sit here and be like, oh my gosh. And it all seems so fake. So I just get angry. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the field. And what is your pregame playlist look like if you have one? Um, kind of what hypes you up? Okay. I like, I realized I went through different phases, but I've realized that I need to listen to pregame stuff that just like puts me in a like, calm happy mood so um do you guys know the band sure sure you should look them up you should look them up okay Um, this is good we're getting recommendations yeah stuff like like that they just come to mind because they're like i don't know calm and happy (laughs) but i just need to feel like when i think of pregame I mm-hmm. think of like being at our field when it's like sunny and the weather's really nice. And I'm like with all my friends and stuff. Like I feel like if I go into a game and I'm really like just happy, that's the best, that's the best like emotional state for me to be in. So I don't want to listen to something that's like, like I can do the, the like, you know, the intense hard rap and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm in the locker room and other girls have it on and stuff like that, like yeah. I'll do it, but I want something that I'm like, brings me joy you know that's good that's good i think for me personally when i played basketball in high school i um it would kind of be like that in the in the locker room but then when we'd come out there would be like music playing and we would go through the lines and i think that would hype me up a lot more yeah um so i guess it, i mean it's just interesting and obviously i i don't know i i mean it didn't help me at all i i never really you know had a big game but that's it's a different so different story. for ever every person though like what kind of like mental state you want to be in exactly yeah the one song that i always listen to it's like first on my little playlist is this is so embarrassing but bloodstream by ed sheeran i feel like ed sheeran is not like everyone's go-to pump up music but that song if you listen to that song it's just very like motivational 
All right, we'll take your word on that, and then we'll play it when we're doing this editing for this video. Oh, good. And we'll get pumped. Um, oh, you so well. You so well. All right, favorite sports teams growing up or right now? Um. Okay, so my dad is a huge like he's a huge sports guy and but is one of those sports guys that are like just watch everything right so I never really got that other than like I would say the Giants for baseball from San Francisco San Francisco Giants like that was probably the only like real like team team that my family and I like all got around but even like both my brother too my brother's a year younger than I am and my, both him and my dad were always watching like what, whatever was on and they're into their like draft stuff, which is, I find so annoying because I'm like, okay, you're not rooting for a team. You're just rooting for yourself. Like there's no, it was always so annoying because I didn't feel like we had anyone to really root for, but, yeah. but yeah, I would say the giants or um, the warriors. Okay, nice. Those are good teams. Um, and also, Kaylee, uh, a warning, don't listen to like our last five episodes. We talk <laughs> about fantasy football and basketball. So just, you know, yes, we are guilty. It shouldn't, okay. I mean, I, I've won the league twice, so I, I feel like I have something. Oh, but but okay. other than that, um, what's your favorite athletes growing up, um, either from Golden State or, you know, even in soccer, in the soccer realm? Who yeah. did you look up to? Um, okay. I totally had a phase where I loved Wayne Rooney when I was in like middle school. Um, and I did really like Man United. Um, that's not really the case anymore. I, like I've kind of phased out of my Man United love. But um, yeah, I really liked Wayne Rooney. I um, got super into like when the, um, the female national team, I like idolized too when I was in high school um and I loved Hope Solo mm -hmm. but those were just like because of the easy you know they're like the easy faces to love um, but for a good reason though yeah like. exactly yeah. yeah I think all of this stuff around like the 99ers and that team growing up I think was like you said like they were it was so it's been so cool to grow up in this era, I think, mm -hmm. of like having those, the female soccer players that are just becoming big and are just seem to be like good people too. I love Abby Wambach. I think she's great. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to like hear their stories. I don't know if you guys know anything about like Abby, um, who she was as like a leader on the team. I really looked up to because she had, like she struggled a lot, like in the beginning of her career with just like who she was as a person, as a leader. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she really was just very real. And I think that was something that I looked up to and I still look up to is like being an authentic leader on a team. So a lot of, I mean, like a lot of the, the athletes that I look up to, I look up to not because of skill necessarily, but um like leadership qualities and being able to like really be their authentic self within sport. Um, yeah. That's really cool. And I think you're right. I think they're becoming more highlighted nowadays in today's society as well. And I think it's good to see. And, and for young sports people that are trying to look up to them, I think it's great to not only look at what they can do on the field, but also outside um, and how they, how they treat themselves um, for who they are, but also in their community. And I think that's what we need to highlight even more. Um, so that's really cool. And it's kind of cool to see the glimpse of like who you idolize and as, um, as, as such too. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite off day activity, um, excluding homework? So you, you can't use homework as an activity. Don't worry. I would never say homework is my favorite. Okay. You know, some people have, so I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> no. Um, I've, I like school, but um, I would probably say either um, I love going to the grocery store. I really love um, I would I like going to like a farmer's market, um, going to 
like an off day for me. This is funny because I already did this today. But we, we, I went with some of my friends. We went to the farmer's market and I would get like, like coffee or breakfast and then um, like go on a walk, just like relax with my friends. But like being active, I think it's, it's hard though, because my, to me, an ideal day would be more like active but if I'm thinking specifically off day like if I have training yesterday and then I have today off and then tomorrow I train again I'll always have to like restrain myself because I'd I would want to go on like a hike or like go to the beach and like swim in the ocean like do that kind of stuff but I'm slowly learning that that's not really sustainable so (laughs) yeah well that's still good are there any good uh trails near USC there are it's hard to find ones that are like not super populated Mm -hmm. so like um temescal canyon is like kind of by malibu um and i really like that one it's really cool because at the like kind of where you get sort of to the peak you can see it's just such a california view it's like you have the ocean you have downtown la you have the mountains with the snow in the back. Oh, wow. Like, you just get everything in one, like, glimpse. And to me, it's, like, so, so L.A., so, like, California, actually. In a nutshell. See, That's yeah, awesome. See everything. Well, well, we'll definitely have to go out there when we somehow get to California. Yeah. Um, okay, last question on the quick hitters list. Um, so, obviously, you've now played – in college and you've kind of had that experience what do you think from all your knowledge was your favorite road game to go to did you like to go to UW or did you like you know stay close UCLA who did you like to play against and like kind of why why go there I loved going to Stanford because it was like kind of going back home a little bit for me because I'm from Northern California um and it was always such a good game like I have so much respect for that team. So I think that it was always like going into it. I was always, I don't know. I always had all my family and Mm -hmm. like people from home there. And it was a game that you knew was going to be intense and you knew it was going to be just fun to play, especially for me as a goalkeeper. I always Mm -hmm. knew it was going to be fun to play in. And then um, they have a great stadium too. I love the like in, it's like intimate, but also like well done too. Which yeah. Is like- the campus is breathtaking. I went to, my dad and I went to um, the Stanford game for the football, um, mm-hmm. UW versus Stanford, I think two years ago. And I mean, just that area in past, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable, but um, okay, great. Well, we are done with the quick hitters. You lasted, um, you gr- got great answers and let's move on to topic two. Uh, Rio, do you want to start us off? Yeah. So you know, now you've, I don't want to say you've completed your goal, but you know, you've made it, you know, you're in your senior year at USC, you know, you have something up for, you know, once you're done with school, you have something lined up, take us through how you got there. It can be a long story, short story, whatever you want. First time you touch the soccer ball all the (laughs) way to, you know, draft day, like tell us what, tell us what happened in between all those, all those years. Yeah. Well, okay. Actually, okay, I'll start with a high school-ish area. Um, This is something that I feel like I've told a lot of younger players. Um, But in high school, like, soccer to me was fun because I got to, like, be around people, and it was, like, the social aspect. And it was something that, like, came naturally to me. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, it was – I wasn't one of those kids that was, like – I always just like laugh when not laugh, but when I hear, when I had heard people that said like, Oh, I've dreamed of this since I was like a little girl, I'm always kind of like jealous in a way because it wasn't really me. Mm -hmm. Um, in high school, it was kind of just like fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and when I got to USC, my freshman year, I came in and I redshirted. So there was a, a senior goalkeeper, um, her name is Sammy Joe. And she was awesome, like totally a great goalkeeper, a great mentor, a great friend. Um, 
And so I spent that first year kind of like learning under her and um, it was the hardest year. That was the year that we won the national championship. So I was not only was I, um, yeah, I was redshirting and like the team was doing, the team was fantastic. Um, so I was around that like intensity all the time. Um, and it was just really a shock for me. I was shocked a at like the tempo and intensity, but also at like myself because I got there and, and I, I say the thing before about high school because like it came naturally and I was just kind of like never really challenged, you know, like it, it was just kind of, I think every high school player kind of feels that, but when they get into college, cause in high school, they're like a big deal, you know, mm-hmm. like everyone, you don't really have to, you work hard, but like you just do what you're told to, you know, you it's a different playing field. Yeah. Playing field. And yeah. you like, there's not as much, um, you're not as invested, you know? Okay. And so when I got to college, I realized like I wasn't doing all the things like it wasn't working that hard before, you know, and I got to college and I was like, okay, first of all, I, the um, goalkeeper trainer that I was working with, that I still work with today, who is like um, my guy, he, his style and technique is very different um, from a lot of other people and what I had ever done. I wasn't very technical when I got into college. So Mm -hmm. this whole year, basically I'm rambling on, but this whole year was like me having to start from scratch Mm -hmm. and it was mentally really taxing. And um, when you're redshirting, there is really no reward. Like at when you're going through it, it's just like every day you're just like kind of breaking yourself down to build back up, but you never get that kind of like satisfaction. Yeah. You, it takes a long time to get the build back up. So um, the, really the reward for me was like being a good teammate. Um, And I was kind of like told by my coaches where they were like, okay, we have a lot of intense, intense personalities. Like we need you as a freshman to kind of be like a light, you know, and like um, make everyone um, like relax people and like bring some fun to things. They nicknamed me sunshine when I was on the team. And like, I was, I was very much just like trying to separate the fact that like, when I was on the field, I was really stressed and really um, like my confidence was really down, but then like as a teammate off the field on the bench, um, trying to be just like my team's number one fan, you know, and like trying to be a good supporter. And, um, and it wasn't just me either. There was like a group of us freshmen who were kind of like tasked with that. Mm-hmm. And it honestly, like, I think it was, really helpful for the team and there was a couple other things that year that were just huge learning experiences we had a group of girls kneel for the national anthem and this was like what five years four or five years ago so it was kind of like new um and we had a huge team conversation about it like just like these crazy big things that happened that year all to lead up to um winning a national championship and so I got to go when you, when you red shirt, you don't get to sit on the sidelines for the mm. national championship. So we, me and all the other like red shirts, we had to like be in the stands, but we like made big posters and like, um, yeah, it was, and we got to go back down when we actually won and got to rush the field. But um, yeah, so that freshman year was super formative for me. It was really like all of these things, not only technically, but just like, learning what a good teammate is, um, learning, like figuring out that I really wanted to be there, like figuring out that this was really something. Um, and this is kind of what I tell younger kids. It's like, you don't really realize how much it's kind of cliche. You don't realize how much you really want something until you're challenged. And, um, that to me was like, when I look back and think about when I started to really like invest in myself and invest in, um, soccer and really realize that this is something that I want to do with my life was that year. And so like, 
flash forward a little bit, you moved into sophomore year. I had, a, I think sophomore year is when I like did well with like awards and stuff, um, mm -hmm. which was actually pretty frustrating because I still felt like in that sophomore year, I was, I still, by the end of freshman year, I realized all the things that I should be doing. And like, I could see like, it, this is very technical, but like in my game, I could, I could feel it was really frustrating because I knew what I should be doing, but my body hadn't like, it was getting all of these years it, of yeah. past um, habits and things like that. It was just like getting rid of them. So mm -hmm. sophomore year, I knew all the things I should be doing and couldn't necessarily execute, but was still like, we had a great team and I was like still getting things done. Um, so and I was young, so like I got some like recognition from it. Um, but it really like frustrated me because I didn't feel like I was at my peak. I was like, um, and I didn't want people to think that like what I had shown was all I could do. So right. like getting some recognition was kind of like, I was like, wait, hold on. Like I, <laughs> I'm not done yet. Yeah, just give me a couple, like maybe I can earn. I didn't feel like I really earned that mm -hmm. um and then junior year I think that's I might get like my timeline mixed up um kind of similar I'm trying to think of when my my last season I think that was considered with the red shirt stuff it's all super weird mm -hmm. but I think my last my like last season that I played in was when I had my um concussion and I like went into that season feeling so good. Like I literally spent that whole summer working with um, a goalkeeper trainer like three times a week. Mm -hmm. And I was like living in LA and just like doing, I was had an internship too. So it was like one of those summers that I was just like, I'm going to put my head down and like prepare. Um, I felt really in control. Like I felt really um, good about my training. I was like, excited about the seat like the team that year was so good mm -hmm. um and I really just put my head down and was like soccer 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 mm -hmm. and then and even in my internship I was like I, I couldn't really give I didn't really feel like I could give my whole self to my internship like energy wise just because I was really and this is kind of like a theme that we'll all probably end up coming back to but like I was so invested in that season that like mm -hmm my school stuff kind of like took a little sidestep. I was still like doing it and going through the motions, but my mm -hmm. heart and energy was so in soccer. Mm -hmm. And then literally we went to, we went to Hawaii as a team to do like a Hawaii trip and like a preseason trip. And um, on there, we had a, there was a PK in the box and it was a super random thing but the ball like hit the post and then hit my head like as I mm. dove um PK save the PK all good but <laughs> go. but it like just the way it like ricocheted it was like right next I might have even hit the post too I don't really know okay. but um but yeah I didn't I was I got up it's funny even like watching the video it's hard to see but like I got up and I was kind of like I knew that I wasn't okay, but then like the adrenaline kept going and I was like, okay, whatever. And I didn't say anything. And so I went back and it wasn't something you could necessarily see. So no one asked anything. Right. So I was like, okay, if no one's going to ask, I'm not going to say anything. So went back to the hotel did. And I like, I've had concussions before, but I've never had symptoms the way that I did with this one. Like mm -hmm. I felt so sick I never threw up but I felt really sick and I was like super mean like everything was annoying me and I was mm -hmm. um I just felt terrible mm -hmm. and I like slept a bunch when I got back and like wasn't myself you know and um I remember like calling my mom and or my mom called me on my way on the drive back and she kind of could tell that something was off about like when I was talking to her and I don't even remember calling her but oh, wow. um but she like called me back when I was in my hotel room later that day and was like hey are you good and I kind of like told her that I think that I might 
had a concussion and she, we finished the conversation and then I was on the phone. My roommate was in the room and then she called me back on FaceTime and, uh, and then she was like, Kaylee, you need to tell Anna. Anna was the other goalkeeper, my roommate. And so she called me back on FaceTime so that Anna could hear. And Anna was like, mm, what? And that, I mean, that was really good just to have someone that she wanted to make sure that someone knew that I was right. And my, yeah. So from that point on, I still didn't really, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell the coaching staff and Anna was just kind of like checking up on me. And then um, I played in the next game and I played in, um, I did like a little training session and played in the next game and thought I was just going to like get my way through it. Um, which is never, I'm like a huge advocate now. Like if you have a, like, even if you don't know, just like say something, you know, and like in the long run, um, these were like two exhibition games. Like they really didn't matter that much, but I think that I was so invested at that point, like kind of what I was saying before, I was so excited about like moving forward and like that season in general that I was like, okay, nothing can, it was just in this mentality that like nothing was going to like get in the way of it. And so um, flew home and was just kind of like waiting for it to go away. And it didn't. So I think like three or four days later, I finally ended up like going to my trainer and just had a big like heart to heart moment with her. Um, And then from that point on, getting back to a point where I didn't have, it was one of those things that like the symptoms lingered so much longer than probably a lot longer than they would have if I had just decided like from the day that I got it, if I had said, okay, I'm going to be done. And I didn't play in that second game or like, who knows what would have happened. Um, but it's hard looking back for me because I, it feels like if I had just said something to begin with, none of that like stuff would have happened, you know? Mm-hmm. So I ended up missing all of pack 12s, which was like a huge blow for me mentally. Um, I was, I had also just decided to move in. This is like a weird other part, but I just decided to move into my own like little studio apartment. Um, so it was like my first time living on my own and I had expected it to be good for me because I, um, I'm pretty social and I kind of, want, I missed having my alone time. Um, cause naturally I'd, I'd rather like be around people. So I was like, Oh, this will be good for you. Like, it'll force you to like be by yourself a little bit more. And then if you want to go, like, you'll have to make more of an effort. And it ended up being like, like, I was glad that I did it cause it was a good experience. But when I had my concussion, it was really hard for me cause I was alone a lot. And my teammates, obviously like we're all traveling. Um, so And I was just like in my head so much um, about um, about like, I couldn't get rid of this like pressure headache that I was having. Um, And I was just so, it's just like, I still haven't necessarily like figured out like everything that was going on at that time, Mm -hmm. but um, it was a really big blow. And I think like my mom and I, talked about it. my mom said this one time like what I was telling you guys before about how like in control I felt during that summer and how like tunnel visioned I was mm-hmm. I was like it was just like the world yeah. yeah and it's the world telling you like even when you think you're in control you're not like you need to it's like you you put everything into this one season Um, and then for something as fluke as a PK and a ball to hit you, you didn't think that would, you know, necessarily take you out of the season. And it's tough to realize, I mean, obviously a concussion is, is one of those things where you can't see it and, and it makes it even more. And I, and it's kind of like, you know, you go into this whole season and you're like, I'm going to work. I've worked my butt off, blah, blah, blah. And for Mm -hmm. this to happen, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. And I, I mean, yeah, it's, I can see where you're coming from in the sense of like, I put all of this work into it. And for something that like that I is out of my control in a sense, yeah. 
just to take you out. It's tough. And man, it's, it's just another like obstacle that you've, you persevered through. And I mean, it, I'm excited. The story is, it keeps on going. I, I like it. So please yeah, keep well, going. I, so when I got back, mm-hmm. um, there had been like a time where I thought that I was like just so many times where I was like, okay, there's a little headache, like, but that's fine. Like that's normal. And so I would like go back and I went back to a practice and then I finished practice and and it got worse, you know, like all these times where I was like, okay, like ignore this, ignore this, like, let's just try. Um, and so I like learned my lesson a couple of times. And so I finally, basically by the end, my first game back was against Cal and Cal, as I said before, like that's home for me. And so I had all of my like family and stuff and my coaches made me wear this, like, not just, you've seen like the header ones, right? Yeah. Not just that one. They made me wear like a, the only way I can describe it is like a, oh, um, like a water polo player, like yeah. helmet thing. It was horrendous, <laughs> literally looked so dumb and it was so all I could think about that game was the fact that I had this thing on my head and I have all my family and all my friends and like community in the stands and I haven't played in months. I haven't worked out in months. Mm -hmm. I lost a ton of muscle mass. I like the mental, like the mental, the physical, everything. I was just like, my confidence had gone from over the summer from here to here, like so quickly Um, and we, I wasn't even really sure, um, that I was going to be playing in that game. And at halftime, we were down one zero and my coach was like, Kaylee, it's time you're going in (laughs) and they threw me in there and I gave up three, I think three, three, two or three soft goals. And like, it was, I like, if you ask me what the worst game I've ever played in, like I've played in games, obviously, like when I've given up more than that, like five goals, we all have, but like that to me is like the epitome of the worst game ever. Cause I was just so like still in that mindset. Like I was still in the mindset of like being injured and so mm-hmm. self-conscious and so like, Yeah. Um, but I got to, I got to my coaches let my coaches knew, you know, and they, they let me stay. I didn't go back with the team. I stayed with my family, um, for the weekend and then just like flew back on my own, which was so nice and really necessary because I just got to like, kind of take the rest of the weekend to relax and, um, yeah. And then came back and then we played, that was kind of like moving into the um, rest of the tournament and stuff and like game by game, practice by practice. I kind of like, I had to get over the fact like that, like there's always like a fear element to coming back from injury. So like, usually if you have like a bad ankle or something like that, you won't go into tackles as hard and that yeah. stuff like that. Um, but I remember like the first practices coming back, I was just so afraid of getting hit mm-hmm. or like the ball hitting the, every time the ball hit the post, I would like flinch. Like it was, mm-hmm. sounds so dramatic, but it was like really hard to come back and um, like feel safe and not feel like I was going to be out for another four months. Right. And then, um, but yeah, we like, we, went through I like gained some momentum back um started to feel I was I was not myself the rest of the season um but I felt like it was kind of we were just like making it through you know um and then we finally played I think in the round oh god I should I should know this but I think it was the round of eight we played North Carolina and um yeah they ended up winning yeah oh wait no See, this is the thing about concussions now. Like, I don't remember. My no, memory sucks. You could say anything and we would believe you. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, they they knocked us out of that. But it was a good game. Um, we That team, the North Carolina team was so good. And we gave them a game. We were up in the first half. And then kind of 
Um, again, like I felt like let in some goals or two goals in that second half that I wasn't like happy with, but um, yeah, overall that was like the end. That was the last time I like played soccer. Right. So I flash forward like COVID and everything. Um, it's been a good, I think a good break for me um, emotionally and physically and all these things. And it, that feels like a lifetime ago, honestly, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think. What is, yeah. What a journey and story. That's, that's great. I mean, just the obstacles from going, like I, I personally didn't know what it felt like to be a red shirt to red shirt that year. So like, and just to get your experiences is, is great. And then um, the whole concussion thing, I, we've all battled through injuries, but like, you know, every injury is different and just how you come out and persevere through. I think that's a great lesson in general. Um, so, yeah. And then I think, so congrats to you on that. And just, I mean, it's tough because when you were talking through your story, I was like, I was thinking like the bend or break mentality. Um, and when I say that, I mean, like, you know, you could have, you could have broken, um, during your freshman year, like, okay, this is too much, but you bend it and you were able to get stronger and stronger to where you don't bend, um, when the pressure gets tough. And then also when you had the concussion, it, it's an easy way of doing that. And I think just, it speaks to your character on the field and off the field, and also to the support you've had, um, with your family and your, your friends and teammates as well. Yeah. So it's a great story. Um, Thanks. so bravo to that. Really, do you have any other questions for this topic as well? And I mean, I imagine, you know, 2019 was a rough year and you're, you know, you're able to play in the playoffs at the end of the season, but you know, now it's your senior year. I'm sure like you're really motivated to get out on the field and like, now you have all this time to recuperate. And now, like, I'm assuming you're feeling like 125%, right? And <laughs> then your season gets delayed. I mean, what is that feeling like? And with all this uncertainty? Yeah. I mean, that's a great, it's a great question because you're so right. Like after that season I was like when I got that momentum back I was like okay moving back into it but I learned my lesson I um when I was in my concussion that's when I applied for grad school mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to do that before I wasn't gonna do my master's I was just gonna do like I was so soccer oriented I was like oh like I'll just do the easy thing like I'll get um a minor and like extend out that way mm -hmm. um but that during my concussion was when I was like, okay, this could be gone at any point, you know, like I could sports are so you don't have control. Like they're so fleeting injury is so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's always out there. So that was when I kind of was like, okay, I need to invest in myself. Um, not just soccer, you know? And so I think that that was a really good moment for me to realize that I need to keep balancing that energy between, um soccer and myself not just school but like other other identities and other things um so moving in now I think over COVID that was a good thing to have in the back of my mind as well so like at first the beginning of COVID I was like so anxious because I was like texting all the goalkeeper coaches that I'd like ever worked with I was like what are some good like at home drills I can do? I don't have any fields to go to. I don't have anything. Like I didn't even have like a ball at my house. Like I literally had to order balls online and yeah, all of these things that I was just felt so, cause you, like what you said, the uncertainty, you don't know when you're going back. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I didn't know how long I was going to have to, like, could this be just like a little month break hiatus where I just like, didn't really think about it and kind of like let myself recoup. But like you said, like I just gained momentum and I was finally feeling like I was moving forward from this injury. So I didn't want that, you know, like I didn't want to take a break. Um, and not, and taking a break is fun and it's nice when you have control over it, but not having control over a break is not fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so I jump roped a lot. That was one of the things that I got from my, from a bunch of my strength coach and from some goalkeeping coaches. And that became like a really good, it sounds so corny. I feel like you imagine like Rocky, like doing his little, like any like 
it's have you seen it now the you're doing it in the studio apartment with a ball (laughs) you're going back and forth it's perfect it's perfect my studio apartment too i couldn't even like i had my the people below me do the thing where they like took put the broom up to the ceiling to tell me to be quiet because (laughs) like the jump rope so annoying on the studio floor so i went out into the alleyway I went out to the alleyway to do my little like jump rope and lift. I had like these 15 pound dumbbells that I was doing all of my workouts with, wow. which is like not a lot from compared to what we like usually do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I, so I was here for a little bit in LA for a little bit. I was back in Northern California for a little bit. When I was back in Northern California, actually, um, in LA, I could at least, I had a guy that I was training with, um, who's awesome that kind of like we went through like the COVID thing together um, and had to obviously like take certain precautions and do it a little differently, but um, it was nice. And then when I was at home, which is where I really wanted to be, like I wanted to be with my family. I wanted to, it's like, especially COVID here, I was not being alone in um, LA during COVID is like not fun. So um, I was home for a majority of the time, but I didn't have a great training at home, um, to begin with, but I found, I went out to the field. I have a sister who's just turned 11. Um, and she, her and I would like go and like find, like search for open fields. And she would like, she doesn't love soccer. She <laughs> plays it and it's fine, but she, you know, would rather be like making dance videos or something like that. But I would like force her to come out with me and we'd like play a little bit. And when we were at one of these fields, we met um, some other girls who I, they had like, a, one had a UW backpack on and they were playing soccer. And I was like, oh, I like walk over to them. I was like, oh my gosh, you guys play college soccer. And they're like, yeah. And it was just like a bunch of like rag, like random girls that I didn't know. And um, I was like, do you guys, if you ever like want to shoot, I would would love people to shoot on and or shoot on me and we just like became quick friends and like ended up going to that fields a bunch together and like I met so many COVID was so cool for that reason Mm -hmm. like I met so many random soccer players in my area that I had never known um and it really like emphasized to me the I feel like COVID has done this for a lot of people, but like Mm -hmm. emphasize the importance of community and um, just like how sports can bring people together. So like that group. And then I also at the same field, like ended up like walking up to some guy who was training someone else and was like a goalkeeper trainer um, and started working out with him. And he was so just like all these things that were so nice to have when I was home. Um, and then, yeah, I like, so I didn't feel super, all of this stuff was like, just kind of, it was nice to have, you know, like, it wasn't like I was being challenged that much, but it was just like nice to at least be out there and be playing, um, and kind of like held me through till I got back here. And yeah, now we're here. That's wow, great. That's, that's super cool. I mean, we've, we've talked to some people and, you know, we talked to, um, person in the Mariners organization a couple of days ago. And, you know, he said, you know, it's nice to have this break, like being home. Cause he's usually just, you know, 24 seven baseball, baseball, baseball entire year. Mm-hmm. But now he has his break. He got to spend time with his girlfriend and, you know, hit with his dad and stuff. And I think, you know, it, it really brings people back home, especially for athletes yeah. who don't always get a break, right. You're always yeah. playing sports or if you're a student athlete, you're doing school on top of it. But I think, you know, COVID has its ups, ups, mostly downs, but there's, you know, there's always some, positives to take out of it. And then last thing I want to touch on before we kind of get into the master's program and what you're studying draft day, were you expecting to get drafted or was that just a random highlight during this, you know, time you're really speeding up to get ready for, for games? I, okay. A month out from the draft, I was not expecting to get drafted. Mm -hmm. I had talked to a bunch of people that were like, Kaylee, like, to be honest with you, like goalkeepers don't really get drafted. It's not like this draft is weird. Like there was all these things that were kind of like trying to keep myself grounded, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was, so I was in this mentality where I was like, okay, 
probably going to have to, I was kind of thinking about going abroad afterwards. I was Mm -hmm. thinking about like all of my options. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the day came to like put your name in. And once you put your name in, you can like start, you start getting some like calls and stuff from people. Mm -hmm. And I put my name in the draft. And then like the day after I put my name in, I got a call from Seattle um, telling me that I was like, they have one pick and they were like, Kaylee, like we got one pick and it's going to be you. And I, they were like super, it was a really short phone call. It was like five minutes, but they're like, just so you know, like we're picking you and um, let us know if anyone else interested so we can just make sure that we can figure it out. <laughs> And at that point, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to Seattle. Like, I was so excited. And um, just like I didn't even think that I was, you know, like I did not think the draft. It was like kind of just like a shot in the dark kind of thing, mm-hmm. especially given like the past season that I'd had. I was like, OK, um, not expecting much. <laughs> but then, um, yeah, I started getting some like other coaches started reaching out and saying that they were interested. Um, And so I was kind of like, yeah, the draft, the whole draft process is so weird. Like not, especially for women's soccer, like the way they do it, like you really have, um, I mean, women's soccer here, like in other countries and stuff, they do it where you have a little bit more like control. Um, But it was weird to just like not know anything and not really, have any agency in the process um but then yeah draft day came along and I was had talked to a couple different people at that point I talked to Orlando like two days before so the goalkeeper coach from Orlando is close with my goalkeeper coach here and they had been chatting I guess months prior um and I was at one point I was going to go out with tra- and train with them, but like COVID procedure wise, it wasn't going right. to work and like all this stuff. And um, Lloyd is the goalkeeper coach at Orlando. He called me like two days before the draft, just like a get to know you kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, to me, it felt more like it was like him just trying to be, um, you know, like trying to be a good mentor kind of thing. Like we just mm-hmm. like talked about who I was and, um, yeah just like had a great so nice long conversation and I really appreciated it but at the end he was like just kind of that same thing like just you know like I've never said I've gotten to pick one goalkeeper in all of my time in the NBSL like we don't most likely it's going to be something where if you can maybe you'll come afterward as like a discovery player Mm -hmm. um and so it was like very low expectations you know um But then draft day, draft day was like an emotional mess because um, obviously Seattle didn't pick me. And I was, I hadn't heard from, I heard from them that first time, but then like two weeks passed and I never heard anything. So I was like, knew in the back of my head, it probably wasn't going to happen, but I still had that little piece, you know? But right before that, um, I like heard from another team who was basically said like um basically like had someone call me and say hey we have a pick right now um but we want to know if you would skip your college season and come to us right now and interesting we have like a minute to decide so if you could tell us right now in this phone call if you can come or not that'd be great and i was like oh my gosh because always like that priority for me was finishing out like that I have unfinished business here, you know, like exactly. I wanted to finish this out. And so, but it's like this looming thing, you know, like your dream Indeed. thing that you never thought you were really going to get. Yeah. Um, and so in that moment, I was like, it was really hard. It was one of the hardest decisions I think that I've had to make on my own. Um, like there was no time for me to I actually like called my dad in which I told them like give me a sec I called my dad hoping he would give me like yes or no and he said Kaylee this is not my decision (laughs) and he hung up the phone he's like you got to make this one and I called him back and I was like you know I I can't like my season's a priority for me like finishing this out is priority for me I'm gonna have to say no Mm -hmm. 
And then I came back out and watched them pick a different goalkeeper. And then, um, then Seattle had their pick and they didn't pick me. So I was like, okay, I just, I just gave it all up. Like, looks like I'm not going drafted. And then like five minutes later, Lloyd calls me and he goes, Kaylee, good news. Pack your bags and go to Orlando. And I was like, what? So it was, yeah. Yeah. It was super emotional, really crazy day. But, um, yeah, the more I look kind of like I said before, like I wasn't really expecting Orlando and the more I talk to them and the more I learn about the organization and the team, just the more like perfect it gets and like the more excited I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and they I kind of like told Lloyd, the goalkeeper coach, about my experience that I had um, with the other team about wanting me to come. And mm-hmm. and he's been so adamant. He's like, you I want you to focus all of your energy on finishing out your college season. Um, Like I want to be here for you if you have any questions or like want to send me training videos, but like, I don't want to overstep, like everything should be about USC right now. So it's just been like a total blessing to be able to do both, you know? That's great. Yeah. I mean that I felt like I was in that room that on draft day with you, just how you re- wrote, retailed it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what is she going to do? Obviously I knew you were going to go to Orlando, but still <laughs> I was on the edge of my seat. I almost <laughs> fell off. I, that's another story, but um, that's great. Can we talk about your master's program? And I kind of want to get into the discussion of, you know, what we have because it's, I'm so excited, but can you tell us more about kind of like what you're pursuing and, and then we can get into the nitty gritty of it. Yeah. So my master's program is in applied psychology and applied psychology kind of uses psych principles and like theories um, and applies them to business situations mostly. So there's a consumer side of um, applied psychology. There's also um, like the organizational industrial side. So I have more of an emphasis on the organizational side, which is like, um, really studying how people work, work as in like, how do you show up in more of like a corporate setting? So um, yeah, it's a lot of it to me is like about um, how people work with each other, how people work in their like spaces um, and getting the most out of people. And to me, like what attracted me to that is like, um, first of all, like being an athlete my whole life, like being really invested in teams. Um, I wanted to know how I could kind of like take my experience from um, such a focus on team culture and um, how a team functions and put that into it. Like, how do I form that into a career or like Mm -hmm. a job in a corporate setting? Um, So that was kind of like my... Um, which has been really, it's been really cool. I've learned my master's program is all online and it's all like pre COVID it was all online. Mm -hmm. So most of the people that I'm in this program with are older in like established careers, Mm -hmm. which is super intimidating as a student athlete because you're, student athletes are intimidated in college classes alone. Like, I mean, I'm speaking from myself but kind of intimidating um in normal undergrad classes to be with people Mm -hmm. that have have gotten here academically and kind of knowing that you are looked at differently and all these things Mm -hmm. um but then to amp that up and to be in a master's program and with people that are, are like asks us a lot of the time to like use examples from our careers and stuff like that and obviously I'm not in a career. So I like kind of use my, um, like my soccer career as Mm -hmm. which, and it works pretty, um, pretty like seamlessly most times. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not like I'm like stretching for it. And if I don't have something, I'll obviously say like, I, the, the people in the program are really cool, but, um, I've learned so much from them and just like, I feel like this whole, this whole like year and a half that I've been in this program is just a great 
um, opening to see like what's out there. Mm -hmm. Um, But kind of like where sports come back into it um, is my capstone projects that I'm working on right now. And that's with a, um, I'm doing like a consulting research project, which is, I'm doing research for this, like, um, I'm doing it for this coach. She's, she has like a professional coaching service. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is kind of like, she's moving her professional coaching service into more like athlete oriented stuff. So she works on people that are trying to transition from one career to another. And she herself was, she was a synchronized swimmer in college and she has spent like her whole career career kind of unpacking um, how her athlete identity has really impacted how she works. And I've kind of found like with, I worked with her a little bit um, because she had worked um, with my mom, not in coaching, but Mm -hmm. in a different, they both worked for Salesforce together. Interesting. And so they're friends and they kind of like, I got connected that way, but we went through this whole coaching session thing together and I was like this is really cool like I learned so much about um, myself and like how really how our background as athletes shapes so many parts of our lives like from the way we show up in um, academically to like our relationships and um, yeah and as you as you think about having a career later on like careers are not like athletic careers, you know, like you may have um, the whole point of her work is like, you have these transferable skills. Like you, you've learned a lot from like your athlete life isn't, it's very valuable, but how do you take these skills that you've learned and how do you really extract them and place them into a different environment? Because they're not, I think the, the struggle that a lot of athletes have is that they, they hear this all the time. They hear like, Oh, your experience has been so valuable. You go to a job career fair and um, they I, like, I've been to career fairs where they're like, Oh my gosh, like super excited about the athlete stuff. And they don't really, they don't really ask how or it's important, but they just like, everyone just throws it onto you that it's like, really valuable. Right. So you get this kind of like, you get this idea that you have all this stuff that is like, you're ready to throw out into the the career world and you're ready to like give that. But then you get there and you're like, I don't really, I don't know. I feel like you get into this and I've talked to other teammates about this too, that are now in careers and they, it's like this, um, Oh, what's it called? there's like a, a term for this where you don't feel like you're um, you feel like you're not living up oh, interesting. to something oh, really great term for it. And I can't remember. It's like you're, but basically it's like you're in a different like, environment, basically on field. Yeah. You're, you're going like a hundred miles an hour. And then when you get into the workplace, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I'm in this, I need to be in this area. I, you know, it's, I feel like there's, different areas in a workplace one you're in a cubicle where you're working maybe with two people and then another it's I feel like it's all different and there's a turnoff between what a recruiter sees from you for a workforce and it's like oh this is great you're an athlete you have this you have these skills that are collaboration um time management but there's a there's also a turnoff where they don't really understand you know yeah the, the full ask the full you know I don't I'm just rambling but I just yeah, I, feel, no. I, I can see what you're saying with that and it's it's interesting they don't understand how it, how it transfers and you don't understand how it transfers either. So you're kind of, you're both kind of just going off of this like big idea that like your skills are useful. Yeah. But when you get in there and you don't know how to apply them and you don't know how they're useful, you feel like it's kind of like an, it's like you, you feel like a fake and a fraud almost because you don't really, because it's been made up that you have all of this to give, but you don't know how to give it. And you don't know, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pre-notion just, kind of, it's like, okay, I'm here to do work. Um, but wait, 
again, how does this transfer? And then how are you going to, I don't think, I think it's a turnoff. The athletes don't really know how it transfers. And then also the, the mentors that are supposed to teach you how to, you know, work in this workplace don't know, aren't, don't, don't know how it transfers as well. So that's something that people need to understand. It's like, how can they work together to make the best of the abilities that you've had and you've groomed? Um, and I think for being an athlete just in high school, um, and you guys have both played in college, so you guys are more of the experts here, but I just feel like, you know, I, I did play basketball four years in high school, but how can I show that to somebody that I want to employ, that wants to employ me, that I can, you know, stand out to, to somebody mm-hmm. else? And then how can I prove that um, in, in the workplace? You know, it's, it's yeah. Like, yeah. And the, the thing you mentioned about like proving it, like that's a big thing because I think athletes are always like in your athletic career, you're always proving something, you know, I think I even said this when I was talking to you guys about my, when I got like recognition, um, you're always like, it's never, there's no time to rest really. Like really all it is, it's like you even like, okay, you start a game. The rewards are very instant. And that's why it's so easy. I think like in college to really focus in on a sport rather than school is because it feels a lot better. Like in school, it's like this long-term reward. Like you're like, okay, I'm doing this because I want to have a good career in like 10 years, you know? But in sports, it's like, I'm going to work hard today because I want to start tomorrow. And when you start and you play well, it's like, great. Okay. Feel good. But then you're always like, okay, on to the next, like you win one game, feel good about it. But like, we have a a next game in two days. So like, it's, it's this constant forward momentum um, that I think is hard for athletes because a, because you're in college and you get like addicted to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, just being able to get into a career now and um, not have that, like, not have, not bring that is hard. Yeah. And I think it's also kind of like with what career you want to be in, it's like, you know, it's going to be a long-term battle, just like, just like in high, in high college, it's like, it's going to be a long-term reward, but then, you know, it's quite, it's a polar opposite, like you said, and college prepares you so well, I believe for the workforce in that, okay, I'm going to study for this, this, uh, this class and I'm, I'm going to get an A, but it doesn't really be like, okay, that's a, that's an accomplishment. I'm going to move on to the next thing and, you know, the next class. And my goal is four years from now, I'm going to graduate for as in, like you said, in soccer and in any sport, it's like, I'm going to win this game, move on to the next one. But I got that, like that rush of, I succeeded. And then in the workplace, it's, it's even sadder. It's like, okay, I'm going to work, you know, up to this amount and I'm going to get there. So I think as athletes, it's really important to set these goals that you can accomplish, um, you know, week by week, day by day, or, or something like that, you know, like yeah. where you can be like, I can accomplish this. Boom. I, I'm going to move on to the next thing. And I think employers also need to be like, you know, I'm going to set this goal one week from now, we're going to see if we accomplish that instead. Now I think it's more like, all right, let's, you know, do the quarterlies or, or stuff like that, mm-hmm. which I think, you know, it doesn't inspire as much as I think athletes have been inspired by like, okay, the coach is mm-hmm. going to go, we're going to win this game. We're going to go by this week. And then if we didn't do it, we're going to do that from there. So this, you know, conversation about, you know, sports and all of these skills that, you know, athletes get or practice. I was curious if in your research, you found anything on, you know, segmentation in terms of like, what's the difference between a person who plays a team sport like soccer, baseball, basketball, football, compared to someone who plays an individual sport like swimming, golf, tennis? Are there differences in how those, you know, are there differences in what skills they get and how that transfers into future careers? That's a great question because it's actually something I'm So my research right now, I've only done the like literature review portion of it. And we're moving into, I start my interviews next week, but that's something that I've, that I've thought about a lot in um, like how I set up research and who I'm asking 
to do interviews from because I do, like I said, the, the woman who I'm kind of like doing this for, she was a synchronized swimmer. So she knows a lot of, a lot of the girl, people that she's kind of like sending me for interviews are gymnasts. And I think like gymnasts are so interesting. If you've ever listened to any of the, like um, the U S gymnasts talk, mm-hmm. I think I can't remember her name, but one of them does a lot of uh, I've listened to a couple podcasts from her and she talks about like this really hard transition that she had um, because gymnasts are, I think like anything like this, like gymnasts or um, swimmers or like track athletes, some them, something that's a little bit more individual, mm-hmm. probably going to be a really different experience. Um, and not in like a positive or a negative way, I think, but like for me, it's one of the things that I'm so not scared of, scared about, but like a lot of my value and even as a goalkeeper, it's kind of different, but I think a lot of the teams, team athletes, their value comes from the team. Um, and like how it's a little bit more collectivist, you know, like mm-hmm. how the team succeeds and that kind of stuff. And there's so much camaraderie that is like why you really love what you do. Um, I know for me, that's like been such a huge portion of it. Like, I don't know if I would have stuck with a sport had it not been for the team environment. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, yeah, you have like these more individual athletes. And I think even the transition from college to like, I think about tennis, for example. So I have a, I have a friend on the tennis team who's awesome. First of all, she's so great and she but she was like homeschooled her whole life and like all of it was for tennis you know like to Mm -hmm. kind of like build her up and then she got here to USC and she was telling me that it's really hard for tennis girls because they're used to their whole life being an individual sport and in college for tennis it becomes more um team oriented so like the way even like you're scored is more reflective of team success and so all these girls who have like grown up in an individual sport now are starting like have to kind of learn how to function as a as a team athlete Mm -hmm. which is so it kind of just like speaks to what you're saying there's got to be a lot of differences because it's a hard transition to make and I think that um like you think about it the opposite way you have a team athlete who their whole life has been team focused and like success comes from what team carries out. And now you get into maybe a career where it's not necessarily like that, um, where you kind of just like have to put your head down and like do your work and just like give it. Um, But I think what I'm really passionate about is like creating, I think those team environments are really successful. And I'm really, I think that a lot of businesses um, like bigger corporate businesses could benefit from using some more, more of those like team elements and um, like learning from sports a bit in a way, like creating success and creating engagement. Um, Cause that's a big piece too. It's like, I, th- I think to me, a team culture really can engage people more. And that's like such a buzz thing for yeah. the industry that I'm in is like, how do you get more engagement? Yeah. I think it's also like, you can also look at like, for instance, the San Antonio Spurs have been such a powerhouse in the NBA. And that is mostly due, I mean, Greg Popovich, who's the coach there has been there for so many years, but he's cultivated uh, a culture of, you know, building up, like they don't, they don't necessarily have the biggest stars, but they've, they found a formula where it works, where everybody is a part and there's not just one guy who's taking it away. And you're right. I think sometimes in businesses, it's, it gets overlooked on that, that first like team forming stage. And I think without being super biased, I think sports does a good job of like, okay, we're going to put these 30 people together in a room um, and they're just going to form and see who comes out atop. And sometimes I think it's like, you know, a freshman can come in and I know it's highly unlikely, but you can become a leader. But sometimes in business, it's like, okay, I'm going to bring an intern in. And sometimes they feel like, okay, I can't, you know, tell, tell my voice or something like that. So I, th- I think there are aspects of sports where you can take um, a lot of that great quality. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, 
you can look at some sports franchises that have clearly do not mold that way and their, their leadership kind of dwindles. And I feel like sometimes that's like a cut and go with like, okay, well, on one hand, this is a great sports team and, and they showed the leadership qualities. But on another hand, you can see right where, you know, it doesn't work. So there's like, I feel like for a business where profits are so big, like, I, I just think that they might not take into account the whole, the best qualities in sports where they can see the downfall just as much from other teams as well. So it's a sticky situation and something that I feel like the research that you're doing can totally, um, you know, remake the wheel in a sense, where I was like, okay, we can take these qualities, but how are you going to mentor them in that area as well? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I think it's interesting. Um, yeah. Drew and I were business majors, so we business and marketing majors. So we were kind of looked at this idea from this organizational perspective. And, you know, I think the emphasis is growing in like working with teams and corporations because mm -hmm. not only do you get more minds together, but you get different perspectives, different backgrounds, different cultures. And that's kind of where this diversity thing comes into play too. And how that's also, I wouldn't, I don't know if how important it is for sports, but it definitely is you know, for corporations and figuring out how to mesh these things together, but it also has to be done naturally. Right. And it's hard now that everything's yeah. virtual. So it's going to yeah. be interesting to see how they adapt. And maybe you'll see something in your research about that too. Yeah. And I think to your point about like diversity, I would argue that like, even amongst sports teams, I think diversity is really important. I, we've had, I kind of touched on this before, but like my freshman year when we had um, a couple of girls kneel for the national anthem. Um, it was crazy how much we grew as a team within those like couple of weeks when we were having those discussions. Um, it brought up so just like I think there were some girls as as a as a freshman i was kind of just like watching it all happen mm -hmm. but there was we had huge personalities um from our older girls and just really different lives like people lived so differently and um coming together and being in a place where you knew that like like it's almost like family you know you you're forced to talk about these things because like we depend on each other mm -hmm. so if if there's something that's like you can't leave things and let them go unspoken. Like you really need to hash them out. And, um, and if you, I mean, if you want to be successful in my opinion. So I think from a diversity standpoint, you, when you don't, like I've been on teams where we all look the same. Um, and even at my um, at SC, like we've had seasons where we're like, wow, like we need to be more diverse, you know? And I think like, it's easy to be really comfortable in a place where you are with people that have had the same experience as you, like look like you, all those things, the comfort level is it's easier, but the value of being on a team, like my, the biggest memories I've had, like the most impactful memories I have of sports are really like being on teams. And my team this year too, is the same way. Like there are so many differences and it just like creates so many opportunities for growth individually, but then again, as a team and like to bring it back, like businesses need diversity because they need new ideas and innovation and all these things like sports teams need diversity because they need opportunities for like individuals to grow too. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think it just like, I'm a huge, I'm a huge supporter for it. And I think that it brings up so many, opportunities for girls to really like grow closer and like have deeper connections with people mm -hmm. um and just become better people in general too no definitely and yeah. i think it reminds me of a really good point like when you're an athlete i think we all speak to this because we've all been a part of sports teams when you're part of a sports team i mean there's probably a couple of teammates that you know really well like things you wouldn't know normally like you know what classes you're taking what's your mm -hmm. mom and dad's name or whatever it might be but in the workplace even though you're spending, you know, nine to five, like in the same office as them with, you know, pre COVID, mm -hmm. you still don't know as much about your coworkers as you much as you might know about your teammates. I think yeah. that's an interesting thing. And that might, you know, that might, that could be the answer to how can athletes affect 
businesses, you know, we need to change the culture of we're working as a family. You know, I have Kaylee's back. I have Drew's back no matter what, you know, we're going to fight to the end together. I think maybe, maybe that the whole, maybe it's a system that needs to change, not so much how do athletes transfer their skills, but maybe the whole system needs to embody this sports mm, mindset. That's yeah. just a random thought that I thought of. No, that's really cool. I like that. I like that idea a lot because I think, I think you bring up a good point about when you, when you know that you're like, going to battle with people, you know, it's so much easier to bring a bond and, Mm -hmm. and you feel, and it's back to that engagement piece, you know, like, I think that we, as just like, as a whole, people struggle really to be engaged in what they're doing. Like, Mm -hmm. especially with a nine to five job, you know, like to me, it seems, seems difficult to make really like make meaning out of things. Um, but I think when you have, I think COVID has really shown this too, like connection mm-hmm. and people and community is like the way to make meaning um, yeah. and sports do that really well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I would say like when you're at USC or any sports, you want to be there, you know, you, you have a passion to go beyond that. And then like you guys said, in nine to five, how do you get that from somebody that's just like, okay, going through the mill of like, I'm just going to crank out nine to five for 30 years and then hopefully retire. Like, I, I just don't see that kind of, I think we need to bring, like you guys said, the sports aspect into that, but it's, it's tough because if somebody just wants to go paycheck to paycheck compared to a sports um, organization where it's like, I want to be there, you know, I want to, you know, collaborate with you guys. It's different because it's, it's hard to get that engagement, like you guys have said. And I, I just don't see unless you come from the top up where it's like, okay, I'm going to make every, I'm going to hire people that are engaged and, and want to be here compared to somebody that's like, Oh, I can get this person for, you know, $15. And then it just, I, I, it's, it's tough. And I think it has to start from the top up. Um, and, and that, that could, you know, be a problem in itself. It's like, you know, the organizations are so stuck on like, okay, we just need to grind out these reports and nothing else. And then compared to a sports where it's like, we need to win this. And the only way we can really win this is if you guys know that person has their back. And I just feel like that's the disconnect in sports Mm -hmm. and and business right now. So I guess that's my question. Like, how do we make that a possibility of where businesses can be like, I want to be here for you and not just because, not because of a paycheck. I, that's, that's, that's why I love college sports in a sense of where I'm not paying for a paycheck. I'm not playing for a paycheck. I'm paying, playing, uh, to be here. And also because I love the sport and that's why there's like, yeah. So that's my spiel about like how I think there's a disconnect and how it still could be a problem and an obstacle. Yeah, I totally agree. I think making, I think to your point too, like making the environment feel um safe Mm -hmm. for people like i don't know there's this like psychological safety is like the term for it but like making which i think um i think sports teams do pretty well i think giving like as an athlete you kind of know that you're gonna need to like you go to practice and you know that you're gonna like try something new and like you're gonna fail um like bringing that element to that's a good point yeah bringing that element to business i think helps a lot too um, when it comes to engagement and making things more a little more like connected you to me the like psychological safety m- comes a lot from the people around you um, and like having that connectedness with the people around you you know like okay even if I mess up here like I'm not going to lose these people like they're still going to have my back um, I think sports I, some sports teams might not do that well but I think that a majority of the ones that I've played on, like you kind of have to do it well because you really like, there is so many opportunities for failure in sports. Yeah. Do you think in today's society, failure in a business is looked upon as, okay, you have chances compared to in sports. It's like, okay, well, we know failure is going to come at this cost, but work through it. Um, Do you think that Mm. in business is more of like, all right, well, Kaylee, I mean, you didn't get the report in and you did the wrong month. Um, you have one more chance or else you're out compared to sports where it's like you said, like more of like, a, um, okay, well, we know failure is going to happen, but it's, it's how you prove upon that. Do you think businesses today are too quick to kind of cut people loose? 
that's a great it's a great point I think of I think of like in defending like literally mm. this whole week we've been working on defending and like we go through the different um situations of like okay if this person gets beat what is your role yeah like if you implement that into a business like if you don't if something happens and like you fail who else like whose role is it to back you up like implementing that I think you'll see less failure. You know, I think if people know that they have, if there is a backup plan and that they're not going to get cut off, Mm -hmm. they're not going to lose their jobs. This might be really soft of me. I don't know. I always feel like when I talk about this, I need to like, I need to acknowledge the fact that I really have never, I don't have business experience, but like, I don't know. I think that maybe if you had people who knew that there was a backup plan and knew that there were roles around them to support them when they took a risk and it didn't. Um, I think, I think there's, there's a difference between failing when you take a risk and failing Mm -hmm. when you just don't do your job, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, But if you're talking about risks and you're talking about someone who um, I think you'll see more, I think you'll see more growth and I think you'll see less failure even if you give, when you give more opportunity for failure, you know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's also interesting. I I would like to see that experiment. It's like, okay, we have a startup business and there's, you're going to be doing one thing. And if you want to take a risk, you can, but if you can't achieve that, we have somebody that will, you know, I I don't know. Like, I I just don't know because I'm not, you know, I, this is my first year in business as well. So, Um, but it's just like, it would be interesting to see like, okay, you can take a risk, and there will be no penalty if you know if you don't come to that standard. But I feel like, and now I'm just talking through what I've done. But like I feel like if I'm gonna say I'm gonna do this, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna set a goal and I'm gonna say I'm gonna do 20 of something else. And mm-hmm. if I don't get that, but I reach the minimum of what I'm trying to get at, I feel like right now businesses are like, I thought you were gonna do that. Like where is that? I I've already pitched it to somebody that you're doing this. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that could be interesting to be like you know what, you took a risk, but you failed. But like, I mean, you I don't know. It's, it's an interesting paradox of like, do people take a risk because they want to achieve that? Or do they take, do they not take a risk because they're afraid to not achieve that? And I feel like that's where sports come in and we're like, okay, I'm going to take a risk because I know I can do this. And yeah, if yeah. I fail, it's, it's fine because somebody has me backed up. I, I don't know. That's yeah. No, you bring like the balance between risk and accountability, mm-hmm. I think is important. Yeah, well, um, and then the- final question. Sorry. Um, I asked, um, so I'm coaching a girls, uh, girls team. It's you 16, 17. I actually don't know. Um, but I asked them, you know, if they wanted to ask you any <laughs> questions and one of the questions, it's actually kind of in relation to this, but the opposite. One of the questions was, would you say certain additional extracurricular activities added to your sock performance rather than vice versa? Ooh, I'm a big fan of, um, I love the idea of cross training. I played a lot of different sports when I was growing up. And I think that like, especially for, um, I think for any sport and any position, but especially for goalkeeping, I think being able to like be athletic and to move, like if you just, if you stick your head into like the technical stuff so much that you forget about like the fact that this is a sport and it's like um that you're an athlete you know i think there's there's some limitations with that so i think um so yeah i'm a huge fan of cross training a huge fan of like getting out there and just like playing sports and like learning new ways to move um the one thing i would say is i am a huge fan of yoga i'm a huge fan of um like med- yoga and meditation and i think it's really um, it's a really important piece of an athlete's career is a like yoga to me, like combines, um, like taking care of your body and recovery and restoring, but also like taking care of your mind as well. And I think that like the visualization piece, um, yeah, all of these, like, there's so many benefits from, from just like being in connection with your body, Um, It sounds really like hippy dippy, but I really have, 
I have at least benefited a lot. And I think the goalkeeper position that I play benefits a lot from visualization, yoga and meditation and being able to just be in connection with your body. Um, yeah. I think the mental side is a lot more important than the physical side too, or, or that at least they, they complement each other. But yeah. I like to go back to what you said about like just playing sports when you're younger, getting that experience. I mean, personally, I still have my participation uh, um, like a uh, little thing um, for when I played baseball. So it, it's just the, it's a, those fun memories that you have and will stick with you, I think is really important. Um, and then once you get older and, you know, you can pursue professionally or as I like to say, intramural sports, it, it's great to then get back into things of those just like, okay, technical, technical, technical. But I think at a young age, you like, I mean, I think winning is the key thing to it and, and having fun is the most important, but it's, I think you're right. And definitely um, cross training and having all those experiences is great. I think right. this is an incredible conversation. We really appreciated your time. And not only do we get to learn about you on and off the field, but also this really cool capstone project. And I think, you know, what's interesting with, you know, just talking to you, Kaylee, is like, we get to learn both sides. You know, some of the people we've talked to, we've only heard about the sports, but like, you're really, I mean, you're getting a master's degree while you're playing soccer. At U, I mean, at USC, like that's, it's not like you're playing at some small D3 school, you know, you're playing at USC, getting, you just got drafted. You know, there's so many things going on. Um, but it's super nice talking to you. Um, Drew and I had a had a blast interviewing you and hope you enjoyed um, being on the podcast with us. So thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. It really, really has had fun and appreciated your time too. Sweet. All right, thank you. Um, and we guys, we'll see you guys next week for another episode.